Bueno, muchas gracias a todos y a todas por venir. Hoy tenemos la suerte aquí en el estudio de contar con la presencia de Magdalena Capelco, que es una invitada habitual nuestra. <risa> Ella, bueno, pues es, es profesora investigadora de, del Departamento de Logística de la Universidad, a ver si lo pronuncio bien, más o menos, Wroclaw University of Economics and Business eh, de Polonia. Y hoy viene a hablarnos sobre eh, bueno, eficiencia dinámica y eh, responsabilidad social corporativa. Ella es especialista bueno, en general en eficiencia y productividad, pero más en, conc en concreto todavía sobre, estos, sobre esta línea de investigación. Así que, Magdalena, muchísimas gracias por venir, como siempre, y tu turno. Muchas gracias, Juan, por la, por la presentación. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, bueno, yo... Eh, de hablar en español sobre eh, papers, sobre la investigación, hacer presentaciones, eh, no, me, no me siento muy segura, entonces sí que, como siempre, <ríe> voy a cambiar el idioma al inglés. Eh, bueno, y el resto del seminario lo haré en inglés. Eh, ok, so, um, uh, the paper uh, I am presenting today is about the, of course, about the measurement of firm inefficiency. Uh, in, the, uh, in the context of food and beverage manufacturing industry, Uh, uh, and uh, in, this um, in this measurement, we account for uh, firms' engagement in corporate social responsibility (CSR). Uh, and this is a joint work with uh, Alfonso de Lansing from uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, so my presentation uh, is divided into five parts. So I will begin, of course, with the introduction, where I will provide you a little bit of the background information for the study and uh, the objective of the study. And then I will move on uh, to develop uh, the method uh, for the measurement of, of inefficiency accounting for CSR. And then I will move to the empirical part of the paper, showing you the information about the data sets. And then uh, uh, showing you and briefly discussing uh, some results. And finally, I will end up with conclusions. So moving to the uh, first part of my presentation. Uh, the introduction. So, uh, the paper, uh, well, as, as the title says, focuses on two issues. No? On, the, uh, on the one hand, this is the corporate social responsibility, CSR, and uh, the measurement of firm inefficiency. So, regarding CSR, um, well, CSR has, has lots of definitions uh, in the literature. There's no consensus on, of course, on the one uh, single definition. And here uh, I have included uh, the definition of European Commission, which I think that uh, quite nicely summarizes, summarizes the concept of CSR. So according to this definition, uh, CSR is an integration of social, environmental, ethical, human rights and consumer concerns into firms, business operations and strategy. Uh, and so, 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 so this is the definition of CSR. And then we focus specifically on the CSR in the food and beverage manufacturing industry. So this industry, uh, with respect to CSR, is particularly uh, interesting uh, case to study because it faces uh, a lot of uh, CSR-related uh, uh, challenges. Um, so, uh, so basically here on this slide you have uh, some examples of, of some factors, of some, uh, of some issues that Uh, drive uh, the development, the need to, uh, to develop CSR in this industry. And the examples are, uh, this is due to, for example, the increasing consumer demand for food with social and ethical characteristics, uh, food safety scares, um, all these uh, scandals that we had, that we were living with, with uh, food issues, which made consumers uh, more concerned with uh, food safety. And uh, the third example is the consumer awareness of the links between food uh, and health. So the increasing demand for, for healthy food. So this is the, I believe that these are the factors that we are really living nowadays. Now, especially I see here a lot of young people. So I, I know that you are more, uh, very much probably more aware than we are now about the healthy food, about the healthy issues, and also the environment, now the uh, responsible sourcing, responsible consumption. Uh, and of course, these are the uh, CSR specific uh, challenges specific to this industry. But of course, it also faces uh, this industry also faces a lot of uh, general CSR uh, challenges that could be uh, could, could apply to all industries, such as uh, water and energy efficiency, the safety at the workplace, uh, etc. Uh, so this is the the industry we study, and 
Of course, we, well, of course, in this study we, uh, we uh, measure firm inefficiency, so in general we, we measure performers of firms, um, in particular uh, the efficiency, so how well the firm transforms its inputs into outputs relatively to the benchmark uh, of best practice companies. And in particular in the study we focus on so-called uh, the measurement of dynamic inefficiency and here the idea is uh, uh, to, uh, to, to account in the inefficiency measures for uh, uh, interdependence of firms uh, production decision over time. And this is in, uh, in uh, one strand of, of literature it is made um, this interdependence, this, this linkages between uh, firms' productions, productions decisions over time is made through investments. Uh, so we focus on the measurement of dynamic inefficiency and um, we also contribute to, to the line of research that is quite recent, uh, that's, uh, which idea is to incorporate a CSR in the formal production framework, in the measures of firm uh, inefficiency using the method of uh, data and development analysis and this is the, uh, the literature that was initiated by the study by Chambers and Serra in 2018 and then, 2018, and then it was uh, developed by, by some authors. So we could somehow summarize that the objective of this study is to um, develop the inefficiency measure that that accounts for uh, the engagement of firms in CSR. Uh, and this approach that we developed here has uh, two stages. So in the first stage, we, uh, we measure inefficiency, we estimate inefficiency, we, we do it uh, separately for each uh, factor of production. Uh, and then using this inefficiency measures developed in the second stage, in the first stage, sorry, in the second stage, we apply these measures in the uh, latent class model to assess the differences between two uh, different groups of firms based on these uh, inefficiency measures. And the latent class model we, we apply also uh, uses a set of covariates, the, the variables, additional variables. But later on, I will, of course, tell you the details about, uh, about the both stages, about the first stage and the, and the second stage. Uh, looking at this, at this method, um, the, the usage of latent class analysis in the, in the efficiency literature, so in general, the usage of this method is, uh, is very uh, common in, in the context of stochastic frontier analysis, but in the context of DEA, uh, the usage of latent class analysis is, is very uh, rare, very, very scarce studies. In fact, we found only one study by York, uh, Yorka in 2014, uh, but what they do in their study, they, uh, they use latent class model in the first stage to differentiate between uh, different groups of firms. And then uh, for this uh, group of firms, uh, they apply uh, efficiency measure, they, they apply in frontier. So this is a different to the approach that we propose because we have the latent uh, stage analysis, uh, latent uh, analysis, uh, latent class analysis in the uh, in the second uh, stage. Uh, so this is more or less to explain you the, the contribution, the small contribution regarding the method, the, the, the mixture between latent class and efficiency analysis. And regarding our empirical application, so as I mentioned, it's going to be a food and beverage manufacturing industry. Uh, in concrete, the, the context is the US food and beverage manufacturing industry over the period 2004-2008. Okay, so this is all regarding the introduction. No? So now I can move to explain you a little bit more details, uh, as I promised, no? more details about the, the method. Uh, so the two stages. So the first stage is the estimation of inefficiency measures using, uh, we use data and development analysis for that. And uh, we use, in this context, we use uh, so-called uh, by-production model that was developed in 2012 by uh, Marty et al. Um, uh, and we apply its further development, more recent development in the by-production model in 2019 by uh, Dagpo and Ode Lansing that developed this dynamic, so-called dynamic extension of this model to account for this uh, uh, linkage between production decisions over time and, and to account for, uh, basically to account for, uh, for investments. 
using uh, as, a, as a measure using uh, uh, dynamic directional uh, distance function. So we base on this, and here our idea is that there, there is a trade. -off. We believe there is a trade-off between production of uh, CSR between CSR and the production of marketable output. So basically, uh, CSR uh, uses resources such as uh, in the empirical application we will have uh, two inputs uh, labor and materials uh, that could have been used for the production of marketable output and uh, to model uh, this kind of trade-off we we model two two technologies uh, two sub technologies one for the production of uh, this this usual marketable output and one for uh, for uh, CSR output and having those, those uh, two technologies, we uh, estimate, uh, as I already mentioned, we estimate efficiency separately for each factor of production, for each output, input and investment. So this is more or less the summary and the explanation why, why such, such method. And then now going a little bit more into details about the, the methods and the formulas. Uh, so basically, uh, the two technologies, as I mentioned, so so this is the easy uh, uh, idea. No? So, we, so we have one technology for the production of uh, marketable output Y uh, and uh, using the inputs, uh, material inputs uh, C and uh, labor inputs uh, L and investments, this dynamics uh, I and the second technology for the production of CSR output R uh, using the same inputs, material inputs and labor, and, and of course the, uh, the uh, uh, investments will also appear due to dynamics. And the final technology is the intersection of these two technologies, so the idea of by-production, but uh, in this context of CSR. And then, uh, based on these two technologies, the final model we estimate is, is, is this model. So, um, in the Ah, okay, I can indicate. Okay, so in the objective function, we have the sum of betas. No, so we, uh, what we are aiming to do, we want to measure efficiency, inefficiency, in fact, uh, because this is a directional distance function, uh, inefficiency with regard to uh, all factors of production. No, so marketable output, material inputs, labor inputs, gross investment, and uh, CSR output, uh, and we have the set of constraints for, uh, for the for the marketable output. Uh, this constraints the first part, no? Uh, so the marketable output using, again, material inputs, labor inputs, the constraint for gross investments. Then we have this uh, second uh, se set of constraints for the second technology for the production of, uh, for the CSR output using the same uh, material inputs, labor inputs, and the constraint for gross investments. And then finally, we have these three constraints. Uh, so-called uh, interdependence constraints. The, the general idea is here to uh, to equalize the optimal values of the uh, of the common variables that that appear in both uh, uh, technologies. So, so the common variables, as we can see, that appear uh, both in T1 and in T2, uh, are uh, material inputs, labor inputs, and gross investments. So, these are the these constraints, uh, interdependence constraints, that were introduced to this by-production model a little bit uh, later uh, by, uh, by DACPO. Uh, okay, so uh, basically the first stage, that is all about the first stage, so this is the model we want to estimate. And then having, the, um, having those inefficiencies estimated, we go to the second stage of analysis, which I, as I mentioned, is, this is the uh, latent class analysis. Uh, so we use in the latent class analysis as a response variable, we use all these inefficiency uh, measures with, with regard to all uh, uh, production uh, factors. Uh, and uh, simultaneously, in the estimation of latent class model, we include a set of uh, co covariates. Uh, and the, and you, here you have the lists of these uh, variables. These are the variables that, um, that are used often in the efficiency literature in those second stage studies, no? to, uh, to analyze the, the relation between efficiency and different factors. So in particular, we apply, as a covariate, we apply uh, size, measured as a natural logarithm of total assets. 
we apply a leverage, uh, the ratio of total debt to total assets, uh, market to book value, so uh, market value of equity divided by the book value of, of shareholders' equity, a return on assets, so the net income divided by the total assets, R&D expenses uh, divided by the total assets, marketing expenses also divided by the total assets, and the trend for time trend. Uh, so more formally, uh, looking at the latent class modeling, so um, so the most common latent class model is for so-called categorical responses, uh, which does not apply to to our context. This is the the first formula where we have probabilities. Uh, so. Uh, well, efficiency is more of continuous, uh, type of continuous response, so here we have the latent class model for continuous responses where probabilities are substituted by densities. And uh, we go a little bit further because, as I uh, told before, uh, simultaneously with the estimation of latent class, we uh, include the impact of this covariance. So the final model, uh, latent class model, is, is that one. So this is the the summary of the second stage. So, so in this way we have two stages and we have all, uh, we can estimate. So now I can uh, move to the empirical part and uh, give you more details about the empirical, uh, about the data and the results. Uh, so regarding the data, so in the study uh, we need two types of data. No? We, we need the, the, the data for, let's call it, conventional inputs and outputs, for, for the, actually three types of data, because conventional inputs and outputs, covariates, th those variables that I showed you before, and we also need CSR. So basically uh, that, that implies that we need uh, multiple sources of data. And uh, our first source of data uh, is for CSR. And this is the Kinder Lidenberg Domini KLD dataset. It's a very common data set, very widely used for, for, the, for the measurement of CSR engagement, CSR performance. Um, and based on the data in, in this data set, in KLD, we estimate, uh, well, not estimate, we just uh, aggregate. No, we aggregate different uh, indicators that are in this data set into one um, uh, aggregated uh, CSR output. Um, in general, how we do it, uh, how is this data set is constructed? So there are uh, seven dimensions that are uh, listed here, community, diversity, employee relations, human rights, product, environment, corporate governance. The first fa five, uh, these are, this is the social dimension of CSR, then there is environmental and corporate governance. So these are the, the three, uh, the three uh, well-known dimensions of CSR. And uh, the data set contains indicators for, for these different dimensions. And the indicators are of two kinds. There are positive aspects of CSR. And these are called uh, strengths. And the negative uh, aspects of CSR, concerts. No? So a strength could be when a um, company applies some uh, pollution reduction program, while concerts could be when uh, uh, for example, there is uh, some, uh, some issue with, uh, uh, for example, with product quality, some, uh, some bad treatment of employees, workforce reduction, etc. Such, such issue. So the positive and negative. Uh, these are measured as dummy variables. So if this uh, positive or negative aspect is presented, then it, the firm is giving the value one. Otherwise, uh, the value zero. So we aggregate those positive and negative aspects by uh, subtracting no, total concerts from total strengths. And in this way, we obtain this kind of net, uh, net uh, CSR value. And this, is, this is basically follows from, from previous uh, research. So uh, based on K uh, KLD, we have our uh, CSR variable. Uh, and then we need a data for for the uh, common input and output variables and for the co covariance that I have shown you before. And the source for this data is com uh, Compustat. Uh, so, so from the Compustat we take the variables that I was showing you be before, now those covariance like, uh, such as size, marketing expenses, etc. And of course the input and output variables. So as, as uh, marketable output we use uh, revenues, as variable inputs we use cost of goods sold, which 
are mostly composed of materials, so later on we refer to them as materials and the number of employees. And uh, we compute investments in fixed assets. Uh, of course we deflate these variables using the price indices and after all the merging procedure, cleaning procedure, outlier, uh, outlier cleaning, etc., the final data sets we get is, is that one, uh, 636 observations for uh, 79 firms for 2004-2018 period, the, the unbalanced panel. Uh, okay, all right, so this is the, the, the data set, so basically now we know all and we can move to the, to the results. Uh, uh, so the, the first set of results is the results of the first stage of analysis, no? the, the computation of inefficiency measures uh, using uh, the, the, the specifically for each output, each input, materials, labor, investments and CSR. So if we look um, at the average values for the whole period 2004-2018, uh, well we can see, just roughly looking, we can see that the most inefficiency, well, we have to remember that these are inefficiency measures, no? because the, the measure that is behind is the di directional distance function, which measures in, uh, efficiency, well, which measures performance in terms of inefficiency. You know? So the, the largest would be for investments, following by CSR, and then smaller values of inefficiency for output, materials, and labor. But of course, we need to interpret these values with regard to the directional vector apply. Well, here the issue was not so easy with directional vector uh, because, of course, the most common directional vector to apply would be the actual values. And we did it for output, materials and labor. Uh, uh, so we use the actual values for, of these variables. But for investment and CSR, it was impossible to use uh, these actual values because we uh, well, that there were some investments and CSR equal to zero or even negative, no? Because uh, as I was showing you, for example, with CSR, uh, the variable was created by subtracting, so it was possible to, to reach the negative values, no? Uh, so unfortunately, actual values could not be used, so we were struggling a little bit here with which directional vector apply. Uh, so finally, the, the other very common directional vector to apply is the average value. So this, uh, uh, that average value we applied for investments, but again, for CSR, the average value could not be used because it appeared that uh, at some instances, even the average CSR value was negative. That also says to us that uh, many companies have more uh, issues with CSR than the positive, uh, in this data sets at least, than the positive sides of CSR, more negative sides. So, so finally, we decided to apply for CSR the, the uh, maximum observed C CSR value, which is also the, the directional vector that is mentioned in the literature. Well, I know that this is not the ideal. I realize that this is not the ideal, but this is what we thought that at this moment would be the optimal for this um, quite difficult data sets we had. So now knowing this, we can interpret better our results. So we can say that uh, with this sample, uh, our out output should be increased by almost 24% uh, of the uh, actual values. Materials and la labor should be decreased uh, by about 10 and 14% uh, respectively. And investment, investments should be increased by 53% uh, of the average investment value in the sample and CSR by 37% of, of the maximum observed uh, CSR value. Um, so these are the results of the first stage. So now moving to the estimation of inefficiency. Uh, now uh, let us move to the second stage, so the uh, latent class analysis. Uh, so um, of course the initial step in latent class analysis is to decide how many classes, no? how, many, uh, how many classes to distinguish. Uh, and uh, that uh, to, to decide on this helped us the AKK information criteria and Bayesian information criteria. So basically, the results for um, for this uh, for this statistics um, were that uh, th three classes is the best fit in this context. So here you have the results of our classes of firms. Um, so we have three classes. No, so. Um, we, we have given them some names. So the largest class of more than uh, 
56% uh, of the sample is the class that we call high overall performance because th this is the class we believe that was performing best with regard to all variables. Performing best meaning the lowest inefficiency values. No? And then we had two classes which are similar in size, around 20% of the sample. This is the uh, high output and labor performance, meaning firms that are performing well on output and labor, uh, again meaning low inefficiency values. And that the third group, uh, high input performance, so the, the firms performing well on input of materials and labor, uh, that is uh, low inefficiency values for materials and labor. Uh, okay, so three classes, and then we looked a little bit into, into these classes. So we were thinking, let's see um, how are these classes characterized. I'm looking at their uh, input-output uh, profile, no? if, if there is something interesting that distinguishes uh, these classes. Uh, so in this table, what you have is the, uh, well, the, the basic statistics, no? just the, the, the statistics for, uh, for, the, uh, for the output materials, labor, investment, and CSR, so, so the uh, uh, production uh, set variables uh, for each of the classes. So uh, from this analysis, what we, uh, what we can observe is that the the best class, no, best in terms of, of efficiency, no, the high performance class, is characterized by uh, the largest average, of course, average, largest average values for all uh, for uh, both outputs of, of marketable output and CSR and inputs, uh, inputs and investments. And on the uh, opposite end of spectrum is the high input performance class, which has the lowest value for all variables. As we can see even the CSR is a negative, no? so they, they had more, on average, they had more, more negative aspects of CSR than positive. The, the high performance class was uh, CSR oriented, no? it, it had more, uh, on average, of course, uh, more uh, CSR, uh, positive aspects of CSR. Uh, so, so this is a little bit more about the characteristic of the classes. And of course, it would be also interesting to see, because as I was mentioning, we, we estimated this, this latent class model, a specific case of latent class model with this sets of, set of this additional variables of these covariates. So here you have the results for these covariates, finally. So uh, in these results, um, the, well, you have the, the two classes, high input performance, high overall performance, and the high output and labor performance are uh, here uh, in this in this results are the reference group. So, um, what is perhaps interesting to, to see from these results, looking at size and marketing, because they have a similar uh, sign, so the, the size uh, and marketing are negatively related with a high input performance class and positively with high uh, overall performance. So, uh, so uh, larger firms and with larger uh, marketing expenses are more likely in the high overall performance class and less likely in the high input performance class. Uh, there is also res result for leverage, which is uh, uh, the, same, the, the same coefficient, that the, the, um, the sign of the coefficient is the same for both classes, so basically less in-depth firms are more likely in high input performance and high overall performance class. Uh, what else is significant? Uh, return on assets and R&D expenses, re return on assets negatively with high input performance and R&D positively with high input performance, only these two variables. Uh, for high overall performance, this is not significant. And the trend, which is positive in both uh, classes. So, so uh, the, the number of firms uh, in high input performance class and high overall performance class increases uh, at the expense of, the, uh, of our reference group that is high output and labor uh, performance class. All right, so we, we are uh, approaching conclusions. So these were the main results of this study. Uh, so basically, summarizing the, the main, uh, the, the main uh, 
uh, issues of the study is that we, in the paper, we analyze the inefficiency in the special context of food and beverage manufacturing industry in the US for the period 2004-2080, accounting for CSR. We, we uh, used for that uh, purpose this two-stage procedure, the first stage estimation of inefficiency, the second stage uh, lat latent class uh, model with using the inefficiency measures estimated in the first stage. Um, well, we believe that this approach, uh, this two-stage approach could be interesting in some special context when, when we think that in the performance measures it is important to uh, account uh, for, for CSR no? and more broadly to looking at the sustainability issues. So that, that, that perhaps this approach could be important in that context and also in the context where um, it is important to cluster, to distinguish different groups of firms and, and perhaps also then based on the clusters um, propose, develop specific uh, policies uh, targeting each, each group. Uh, what we found uh, is we detected three classes that we called uh, high overall performance, high output labor performance and high input performance. And in general, high overall performance, the best firms tend to have larger size, lower depth, and higher marketing expenses. Uh, and of course, we realized that the study has, has a lot of limitations. Uh, so these are some, some limitations and possible future uh, research uh, areas. So of course, one, one issue is the aggregation, no? how we aggregated CSR. No? We, we use this kind of net score, basic net score by summing the positive aspects, summing the negative aspects, and then subtracting one from the other. So we realize that, of course, it's, it's not the best way of aggregation of, of the CSR metrics. Of course, widely used in the literature, but of course not ide ideal. So we believe that that could be one idea for the future research to aggregate better CSR. Uh, we also think that uh, it would be interesting to see the the issue of transition of fields between uh, classes over time uh, to, to see how the, the, the belonging to the class changes over time. We have, we have quite a long period, uh, so, but, but for this analysis we would need a balanced panel, so we would need to, to change a little bit the data sets we use. And uh, of course another possible extension is to, to, instead of focusing on efficiency, focus on some uh, productivity measures, uh, some uh, changes over time, the, the, the composition, etc., and use it as the uh, response uh, variable in the uh, latent class analysis. So these are some, some of the uh, possible future research areas. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention, and I now will be happy to answer your question or your suggestions. Thank you. Bueno, ahora turno de preguntas. ¿Alguien quiere preguntar? Se puede preguntar también en español, ¿eh? En inglés, español, lo que queráis. No sé si ella entiende. Y ella contestará como quiera. ¿Una pregunta? El, el problema que planteas es, digamos, de programación lineal o de programación lineal continua, que parecen uno o varios, a, al final aparecían ecuaciones de igualdad. Eh, ¿Son necesarios algoritmos eh, adaptados al, al problema que, o los problemas que resuelves? Sí, esa, esa transparencia. A esto te refieres. Sí, esto está del, de la literatura previa en general, eh, de cómo se construye este by-production model. Claro que nuestras, eh, eh, oye, me falta palabra, constraints, ¿no? Los, eh, Restricciones, eh, bueno, son específicas para el contexto, pero en general la, eh, esta idea ¿no? de, de tener dos tecnologías ¿no? separadas y luego estas eh, restricciones de igualdad vienen de la literatura previa. Estas sí que son un poquito, se, se discute mucho en la literatura, sí, pero bueno, me, a nosotros nos han convencido el argumento del de investigador DACPO que... Que, que, que ha dado argumentos que sí que estas restricciones hay que dar para poder eh, eh, llegar a las mismas eh, soluciones óptimas ¿no? para eh, las variables que aparecen en, la, en ambas tecnologías, en la T1 y T2. Pues en general es la literatura previa adaptada un poquito al contexto. 
¿Alguna pregunta más? Bueno, yo sí tengo preguntas. A ver. <risa> bueno, lo primero, eh, no sé si lo has dicho, ¿está publicado este artículo? Está. Ah, ¿dónde lo habéis publicado? Eh, Applied Economic Perspectives and Policy. Es un poquito de, relacionado con agricultura. Ah, vale, vale. Pero fue special issue. <risa> Después un congreso. Pues si está publicado ya poco puedo decir, ¿no? Pero, Pero para futuro, Pero ¿no? Bueno, eh, a ver, hay, un, hay una cosa que yo no, no, a ver, se mezclan muchas técnicas. Se mezclan muchas, muchas, sí. muchas. Entonces hay, hay, en concreto, el uso del by production. Claro, yo lo veo novedoso y original porque yo lo he visto más utilizado eh, dentro del contexto de la contaminación. Entonces, en, en by production, pues tú tienes dos tecnologías, T1, la tecnología limpia, digamos, estándar, la de siempre, la de, la de toda la vida, y en T2 es donde interviene ya la, la contaminación, el subproducto, ¿no? Entonces, yo qué sé, si estás produciendo e e electricidad utilizando gasoil, pues, eh, sin, aunque no quieras contaminar, pues contaminas, ¿de acuerdo? Entonces, hay, ese subproducto es algo que no, no controla la empresa del todo, ¿no? Si quieres producir en electricidad. En este caso, en este, en este contexto, ¿cuál es la motivación o sea, ¿cómo, cómo, ¿Cómo interpretas entonces las variables de responsabilidad social corporativa como algo no controlable por la empresa? Eh, ¿sabes? Porque las utilizáis al final como subproducto, ¿no? Es decir, bajo el enfoque este del by production. Sí, pero, pero no es necesariamente... Bueno, porque las restricciones ¿no? son eh, iguales, ¿no? porque en by production serán distintas, ¿no? porque será eh, algo que no, no queremos. Aquí son iguales. Bueno, la motivación es básicamente que pensamos que, que hay, hay este tipo de trade-off, ¿no? que si produces uno, entonces utilizas recursos del otro, algo así. Pero sí que esto es para, eh, yo estoy de acuerdo que es para discutir ¿no? si, si César debería ser la segunda tecnología o, o la misma. Pero ahora bueno. hay estudios que incluso hay tres tecnologías y cuatro he visto. Ah, bien, bien. <risa> pues vale. vamos por allá. Bueno, hay ¿cómo? una tecnología de, de, de BET, una de Marketable y la tercera de, de, de César. He visto incluso estudios de, sí, bueno, de esto. Es gratis. Pero, pues. pero sí, yo estoy de acuerdo que esto es de, de discusión también. <risa> Vale, entonces, eh, a lo mejor no tiene sentido lo que voy a preguntar, pero, claro, ahí tenéis variables dentro de la, del CISAR, unas son positivas y otras negativas. Sí. ¿Esas variables son todas, o sea, pero son variables 1, 0, son binarias? No. Son binarias. Tod todas son binarias. No, o sea, pero son binarias porque tú las traduces a binario o porque son bin en la base de datos ya son binarias. En la base de datos son binarias, sí, mm, sí. Yeah. Si algo aparece, entonces tiene el score a 1 y si no, entonces es 0. Porque y no ya sabemos pensado. que es muy relativo esto, ¿no? Yeah. Ya. Y, y construir una que sea una variable CISAR de estas positivas, digamos, y otra negativa, y trabajar con las dos. Uh -huh. También eso. es una opción. Uh -huh. yeah. También. Pero no, no habéis querido trabajar con eso, sino queréis construir una única variable agregada de todo, y eso es lo que habéis sí, trabajado. Sí, porque, porque ¿no? como siempre fue el problema de dimensiones, ¿no? Del, que, bueno, porque aquí dos tecnologías, ¿no? muchas variables y otra vez no, no tantas observaciones, ¿no? por año al menos, ¿no? porque luego en total hay muchas, pues, pues fue siempre esto, pero eh, sí que en, los, en la literatura en general eh, se trabaja esto, pues por separado, eh, como tú dices, con los aspectos positivos. Sí. Y negativos. No, esto es muy interesante también para incluir, porque creo que dentro de eficiencia no tanto, más bien en estos estudios que hacen regresiones, ¿no? que relacionan CSR con medidas de desempeño, pero dentro de, de eficiencia. Luego, pues eso es una buena idea. Gracias. Luego, sobre, sobre el translation invariance, yo creo que has comentado, sí. Eh, ahí, ahí, sí, ahí sí que hay un problemilla, ¿no? Sí, yo lo sé, pero, pero yo estuve dando vueltas y no. Porque el vector translation invariante siempre no puede ser el de Portela, porque aparezcará un cero. Y luego cero para input specific no, no saldrá la solución. ¿No te funciona? ¿Lo probaste? Sí, no, porque eh, en este translation invariante de Portela, ¿no? De, sí. Entonces, siempre, porque es el, no, basado en mínimo y máximo, ¿no? pero sí. siempre para una empresa habrá vector cero. Y, y cuando es input specific, output specific como aquí, no, no sale la solución. Ah, vale. Entonces, porque esto es la ah, porque, eficiencia. Ah, es, ah, es específico, sí. Es específico. No, no ah, puede bueno, ser, porque ¿verdad? porque no es una DDF de verdad. No, no. <risa> es un modelo aditivo. Entonces, yo creo que esto es, tal vez, alguna idea para futuro, crear un modelo ah, de bueno, input-specific translation invariant. O ya hay solución, pero yo... 
pero claro, si es un, en el fondo, a ver, pues entonces esto es un aditivo, entonces lo que tienes que hacer es convertirlo en un weighted additive y es en el weighted additive donde tú tienes que utilizar unos pesos Ajá. determinados, no sé, quiero decir, ¿Sí? Ajá. yo creo que sí, pero es que al final una DDF con, que, que es específica para cada dimensión, pues es como, como los modelos de Jesús que son aditivos. Ajá, y entonces utilizando un peso... Yo, yo creo que sí, ¿no? Los, los ¿Sí? weighted additives sí que son, sí son translation invariant, lo único que tienes que tener cuidado con el peso que utilizas, pero con pesos estrictamente positivos y tal, eso debería funcionar. Pero bueno, no sé, para estudiar. Sí, pero... sí, porque esto no se me ha ocurrido, porque yo de verdad con los vectores. No, yo, sé, yo, sé, yo sé que Rolfer ha, ha metido la literatura mucho, bueno, esto se graba y luego sale y tal, pero bueno, como es en español no se va a enterar si le digo algo. <risa> ha, ha, ha metido estos modelos de la DDF, input y output specific, pero es que eso estaba ya creado, esos son los modelos aditivos, porque te mueves en cada dimensión de una forma diferente. Entonces, bueno, Ajá, pues okay, entonces, yo eso lo, lo, te lo digo para, para estudiarlo para el futuro. Uh -huh. Gracias, Luego, gracias. Pues esto sí hay, hay otra es cosa muy que yo... porque yo estoy... No, no, no te preocupes. Yo tengo conciencia que esto no es... Que ah. Necesitamos translation invariant, pero estuvimos no buscando y... Y, y luego el, el tema de la segunda fase. Claro, hay, hay muchísima metodología. Yo ahí casi que me da miedo meterme porque, porque ahí, ahí la gente se pelea <risa> hasta en los congresos de que... De qué, de qué modelo hay que utilizar eh, eh, con fronteras en concreto, ¿no? Y aquí, bueno, no está así Mary Wilson, pero si estuvieran te habrían dicho por qué no utilizar su método basado en bootstrapping. Y quieres decir, supongo que quisisteis ser originales, me imagino, ¿no? Sí. Eh, fue esa, esa es la motivación, ¿no? En el fondo, quiere decir. Pero bueno, pero ellos no tienen ninguna propuesta para eh, latent class, ¿no? Model para... No. No. no ah, pero, pero dices pero sí que para, dentro. Sí, para ah. intentar explicar. Si, lo, si la idea es explicar el score de eficiencia como variable de respuesta en función de otras variables, que son todas estas, esto es el modelo de segunda etapa o segunda fase, bueno, no sé, que hay, varios, hay varias metodologías, te lo digo por eso. Sí, por eso, entonces esto está... Pero vamos, que habéis sido Pero de desarrollar entonces un modelo con bootstrap, con, bueno... ¿hmm? Bueno, no, no, no sé, no sé, igual ya es mucho, pero... Sí, no, 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 es muy buena idea, ¿no? pero yo no sé si soy capaz, ¿no? no pero con no. la ayuda de vosotros... No, 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 no. yo no sé literatura no me meto porque no, me da mucho respeto. Learning, machine machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, exacto. Y luego, claro, bueno, ya para acabar, pero... Eh, claro, supongo que es difícil pensar que detrás de todo esto hay un proceso generador de datos claro eh, yo lo digo porque si no claro cualquier método econométrico que utilices pues es bueno o malo no se sabe porque como no hay forma de compararlo si no hay ningún proceso generador de datos supongo que es complejo crear uno no porque estoy mezclando hay muchas cosas hay dos tecnologías eh, supongo que es difícil para luego hacer simulaciones y porque la base de datos, reto, creo, la, las, empresas que es una, la, las empresas son todas las empresas de un sector, es una muestra de empresas. Eh, una muestra, ¿no? Es, es la que están empresas. en KLD, pero son las más grandes claro. de Estados Unidos. De Por lo tanto, pero, claro, no te, utilizas, no, no te interesa exactamente la eficiencia y beneficencia de, de cada empresa en concreto. De hecho, muestran los resultados pues, por sectores o por tal, ¿no? Quiero decir que no, 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 no interesa justo la de una empresa en concreto. Quiero decir que estás utilizando técnicas de estadística descriptiva, para hablar claro que es el DEA, cuando realmente tú quieres más allá, tú quieres hablar del sector, o quieres hablar de tendencias, o quieres hablar de... Entonces, hay, supongo que es difícil tener un proceso generador de datos, o sea, a mí tampoco se me ocurre, pero claro, eh, si, 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 si hubiera uno, si hubiera uno sí que se podría llegar a simular. Pero vamos. Primero hay que simular no la dinámica, ¿no? Todo claro, probablemente. es que es difícil. <risa> Pero no bueno, hay, hay para futuro, futuro, para futuro, hay futuro, todo hay futuro. para futuro. Como hay gente joven aquí, pues, años, claro, como hay gente ¿no? joven. O especialmente vosotros, ¿verdad? Vosotros sois el futuro, nosotros ya, bueno, somos todavía, pero ya para apoyar ya, ¿no? Que cojan el testigo, que cojan el testigo sí. y continúen. Bueno, Matanera, gracias, muchísimas gracias, de gracias, verdad. Gracias, gracias por Buen los trabajo, gracias, gracias. ¿Algo más? ¿Nada? Ajá, gracias. Gracias por